Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity Podcast, episode 161. You are in for a treat today and we are in for a treat today because we are joined by Mr. Paul Bassett. Uh, is joining us on the podcast today. <laughs> we have, we have you all didn't make your, You didn't make the appearance fee available. <laughs> you, know, you know, I need it in my bank account before I turn up. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like Arnold withdrawing his name from the uh, the Arnold Classic in England because uh, I don't I don't know all the behind the scenes thing, but his his money wasn't cleared, so he didn't even come over to the event last year. <laughs> Because uh, it was uh, it's kind of licensed to have his name and his uh, and everything else and uh, something went on behind the scenes and he didn't get the money so he didn't even come over. Um, anyway, yes. So Paul Bassett, we are joined uh, with the three of us today, the three hosts. Um, we got some big big shows coming up. You know, we've uh, we got guests that we're we're lining up. We've got our world first coming next week uh with dan john and phil maffetone uh two giants of the uh the health fitness and sports performance uh industry is uh for the first time uh meeting on you know on, in a podcast or on a stage or on screen or anything so so we're looking forward to that and we're also lining up some other fantastic guests but today uh the three of us are going to be uh talking and musing and discussing some things um along with uh, the conversation we had last week um, with, with Matt Shaw. We're going to some of the topics that were brought up in there. We found we thought were really interesting, so we're going to kind of um, dissect and delve into those a little bit. Um, but before we do, let's welcome our usual hosts, uh, Mr. Peter Lant in Bath. How are you doing? I'm knackered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. I'll tell it how it is. I'm I'm knackered. I'm feeling a little bit knackered and overwhelmed, to be honest. Oh, but okay. It is what it is. Um, no, because I'd like this walking um, group that I'm starting up. The the next one's on Saturday, and I'm getting inquiries about it because I I thought, you know, when you start some like a bit of a, a bit of a walking group, people like a bit of walking and all that. So I'll just say meet here and we'll go walking. And then the amount of questions that you get about have you got an OS map with the gradient on of the hills that we're going to be going up and all that? And I'm like, no, I haven't. So you know. Do an FAQ. Just send him an FAQ. No, nah, no, James said that, yeah, but I, I haven't got to that yet. I've, I've just, you know, all I want is people to turn up and walk. So it's, it's. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's just one of those things that you just, at once it gets going and you get in the flow, it's okay, isn't it? And then people turn up and all of that sort of stuff. But at the minute, it's in that thing of like having to, having to try and anticipate all the questions that are going to come in. You know, because like some people, yeah, like 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 we said, and like Paul said, make make a list of all these questions that come in, and then it will be you know when you do get a spare half an hour, yeah. you can type it into a document and just cut and paste it out to anyone in who inquires, can't it's, you? But yeah, it's, it's, uh... it's just things like will I, you know, I'm I'm very unfit. Will I be able? To, will you be able to accommodate me? And it's like I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so you know, it's it it depends, doesn't it? I don't, I, I can't ans actually answer that question. So... You're strong enough to carry them though, aren't you? Well, I've people like that have said, um, just come along because there's the, there's a hill at the very start, um, and if you feel like you have to turn back, I'll come with you, and then the rest of them can carry on because there's at least one person coming who knows the route, so she can carry on and take them around because Sean's not here this weekend, but she would usually be there as well, and she would just go off with other people, and I'd say, right, well, I'll if you can't make it, I'll take you back, and so I'm like, everyone's going to be looked after, but it's just. It's it's tiring answering all these questions. That's not we, the only thing, but there's lots going on. But that's like that that, yeah, was, we, that was something I didn't really anticipate. <laughs> no, I mean after after our after our chat last week with Matt, we've had some people sign up for the uh for, for, for the mace uh, the mace day and um and then Steph's been sending emails out to everyone who signed up, but we're kind of fairly used to running events now, but still you have to put down, you know, kind of like Remind people of, you know, the day, the time, yeah. you know, maybe turn up half an hour earlier to register and get comfortable, you know, brings, there's a fridge if you want to bring food, if you, you know, maybe bring a mace, but if you haven't got one, don't worry. These are the kind of clothes to bring, bring a towel, bring water, you know, you just kind of have to lay it out, don't you, as, uh, and eventually you'll, you'll get to that, um, you know, kind of uh, level of just having it automated, but it is, you know, you, but like you say, all the questions you get, we, we're doing a, I was going to actually mention, we haven't spoke about this before, but I mean, it's probably a bit far for you, but we, we've got a walking weekend we're doing next June 
in Norfolk uh, near Great Yarmouth. And we've got 33 people coming for the weekend, which would be lovely. So if there's any chance of you coming down, um, you, it, it'd be lo lovely in a different part of the country for you to walk in. But um, yeah, so we've got 33 people. And for them, it's also, you know, booking hotels and yeah. you know, arranging transport and it's all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's a step now just sort of finds the hotel, sends everyone the link and says, you know, this is the reference number, book yourself a hotel, come back to me, tell me when it's done. But yeah, organizing events and things is, uh, there's so much to think about. And no matter how, no matter if you think you've got everything covered, there'll always be a question that comes up that, you know, um, you yeah. never thought of or no one's asked before. So yeah. Yeah. Um. I know because for this it's literally like we'll turn up at this place at nine o'clock we'll go we'll do the walk which isn't that far and then we're done that's it mm. yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is it so yeah. it's that thing isn't it you've seen it on like facebook and stuff where someone will put up a post and say i put this post up and it says we start here at this time on this date you need this this, this and then Inevitably, the questions come in. What time does it start? What date is it on? Because nobody <laughs> reads the actual stuff. <laughs> well, yeah. Trying to find the address of the of our business, which is on the website, which is on Google Maps, which is in <laughs> on Google, which is in the text that they get in the email that they get. Where yeah. is it? Yeah, where is it? It's like Google it. It's there. Do you want me? To, <laughs> there's a link. There's a link you can go to called Google it for me or something like yeah. that. And you can send the person the link. You type in what they need to know. And then you can send them that link. And it literally sends them the link and types it into Google for them. <laughs> they could have just done it themselves. It's like, there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how are you, Mr. Paul Bassett, in, uh, in Putney there? During lunch, a bit bored. Um Asked uh, Chat GPT to uh, convert Homer's Homer's Iliad into a haiku poem, which I thought was quite impressive. It did the same for uh, the Lord of the Rings, and um, existentialism and humanism by Sartre. You could always you could always do some of these uh, podcast canvas while you're, <laughs> while you're while you're bored. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> a little bit a little bit of an in joke there. <laughs> yeah. anyway. well i did get it i did get it to rewrite american psycho as a kid's book okay well, I've, read, I've read i've read that brett, brett easton ellis isn't it i think i read yeah, that yeah yeah if you know if you've read it oh, right. yeah no it. it's not yeah. a kid's book it's just... no it's certainly not a kid's that. book no no, it's certainly not a kid's book. But the thing is, is it, it literally <laughs> takes two seconds. I just put it on speakerphone. Mm. I don't even have to do anything. I could be concussed and it would do stuff for me. Mm. <laughs> that, which is, I, gonna, my, it's actually it my... Like, are you going to use it to do, like, constructive stuff and that as well? <laughs> I just... do, actually. I do use it for stuff. I yeah. do use it for oh. stuff. I, I was trying to get into mid-journey to see if it can do graphic design, just so we tell... Um, but uh, no. So are you now anyway. are you currently reading the kids' version of American Psycho to your kids before they go to bed? Yeah, is that? Yeah, it's not bad actually. It's uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see. So a typical guy. Beneath the surface, there was more than met the eye. But in our story, we'll keep things light. No gore or violence, just smiles so bright. So as we close this tale, let's all agree that Patrick's adventures are not what they seem to be. In the world of imagination, where stories are spun, we'll leave out leave out the darkness and have lots of fun. Is that it? Is that the abridged version? Well, that's the, the, yes, version. Well, that's, the that's the second half of the abridged version. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't really go into gory details. No, so. good, good. You give them nightmares. Yeah, yeah. Dude. I don't know. I don't know how. It was a horrible it. book. I remember reading that as a horrible book. Um, yeah, it's a horrible film. book. Yeah. yeah, I've seen the film, but the film's kind of not as horrible as the book. No, is it's it? not. No. Yeah. Anyway, it's one of those books you don't know why you read it. Yeah, you didn't know what you accomplished reading it. No, and you don't know why you wrote it. To be fair, but there you go. <laughs> anyway, let us begin by wishing a former guest and friend of the show, uh, Gary Clark, uh, best of luck. He's actually he messaged us and he's just posted. He's out in uh, Orlando, Florida, for this weekend for the. Uh, 
the Magnus for Magnus and Adaptive Strength World Championship. So obviously Magnus was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Gary's been on the podcast a couple of times, who is the chap who uh, who organised, run and competes in the Britain's Strongest Disabled Men. And um, he's out there uh, in Orlando. I think it's Orange County, I think, uh, um, event centre or something like that for the uh, the 2023 World Strength Games, which is also including the Adaptive Strength World Championship. So best of luck to Gary. Hopefully I look forward to seeing some uh, some posts and things from him um, over the weekend at that event. And uh, we're also lining up a few guests uh, who, who Pete and I met um, at the Disabled Strongman event. One really, really uh, lovely, lovely girl who we're, we're, we're lining up to get on the podcast, which hopefully we'll be talking to um, in the next few weeks. Um, so, yeah, we, we obviously had this chat with, uh, with Matt last week. And one of the big things, I mean, a couple of things that, that came from it for me, which I really, really liked, um, was his emphasis on uh, outdoors and the outdoor kind of life and the benefits of, of fresh air and community and actually training for something uh, more than and greater than, you know, just being good in the, gy- in the gym, as it, as it were, you know, training for, for something that's got real carryover into everyday life. And then something that we went into quite a lot of depth about, which I wasn't really expecting us to, but I thought it was a really, really uh, sort of beneficial and interesting conversation really, was when he he heavily went into this kind of body composition, um, you know, cover model space where he was getting ready for a photo shoot and getting kind of as lean as possible and getting more into bodybuilding and isolation training and it was all about aesthetics and that was the goal and he said it's fine because that was the goal at the time was to do that and I think on reflection he said that um, he actually went into that so heavily because he was maybe trying to get away um, or uh, distract himself from maybe some other stuff that was going on in his private life at the time we didn't go into what that was but obviously you can you know we can kind of kind of think of times where we've maybe all had stuff going on personally and he kind of dove deeply into this to kind of um, distract himself and remove himself from some other issues that were going on um but yeah you you found that quite interesting didn't you Pete the way he kind of you know I did, I did, yeah because I mean, I don't know about you, but and I don't know about everybody, but like for me, it's like, you know, there's always like a secret desire to to look like that, to be fair. If you could do it, if you could take a pill and look like that tomorrow, I'll, you know, who wouldn't, to be to be honest? Um and I used to I used to feel like that. And I used to get I didn't get down about it, but like I'd see myself in the mirror and I'd just be like, I'm not happy with that. But now that I'm stronger. And I'm fitter, and I feel healthier. I don't actually. I mean, for when I was at my biggest, I say my biggest. I was like 13 stone. I wasn't like obese or anything like that, but I was flabby because I didn't have much muscle and I wasn't strong. So the weight that I carried was body fat, basically. Um, but when I changed that, I actually went really skinny and I went down to nine and a half stone because I just lost all the body fat and a bit of muscle and all that because I thought that's what you did. But then when I put muscle back on, so I'm now, I mean, what was that? I went down to like 62 kilos or something. And I'm now at like 73. So I've put, I'll have put some body fat back on, but I've, it's mainly muscle that I put back on. So feel it, but I'm not ripped. So feel it, I feel stronger. And I don't look that much different to when I was flabby because I've still got a layer of fat. But I feel a hell of a lot better and I can see myself in the mirror and go, I could get rid of, it. I've got like a couple of tiny little love handles, you know, it's like um, Alan Partridge, isn't it? He goes, I've got a fat back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he goes, it looks, it looks fine in casual clothing, but you know what you, you know, but like just little fatty, fatty deposits above the belt line. You, you don't know, want to see me. I think the line is, it looks fine in casual clothing, but you don't want to see me in underpants. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> that's it. So, um, it's only Sean who gets that privilege, to be honest. <laughs> um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, where was it? Yeah, so I, I actually don't look that much different. But in my head, I look way better. You know, so actually it's the perception of, of what I'm seeing rather than, than what is actually there. Um, 
And if I wanted to be rich, I could probably do it in, in a couple of months. But I, I, it's not a goal. So it was interesting when, when Matt was talking about it because I've, I've, I've thought about it before and thinking like, well, you know, how hard can it be? And it turns out from listening to him, even though he was, you know, he said he, he, said he didn't walk around with a six pack and stuff like that naturally. And mm. that's because some people do. Mm. Some people just lose body fat like like that and they're ripped and it's like, there you go. And he said he really struggled with it. And I think that would happen to me. And I'm a similar age as well. So it's like, you know, I've, I've toyed with it before, but then I'm like, nah, sorry, I'm just going to keep getting stronger. I think the line good. that he used, which was quite good, which I think is, um, it was from a film. And I think it, uh, it, no one will know the film. A couple of people might. I think it was called, I think it was called The Girl Next Door. But there was a thing saying, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know? Yeah. Um, and he used that, didn't he? He said, I got to the end and I realised that the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. You know, the, the result he got and the way he felt and the way he got there um, wasn't really worth the, 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 the impact and the toll it had on him and the rest of his life and personally and emotionally and psychologically and, and all the rest of it, um, which, which was quite interesting. Um, you, you obviously, uh, Paul run the amazing 12 program, which, which kind of people go into the a 12, you know, the full, the classic, the amazing 12 classic is a 12 week program where, um, Obviously, at the end, people have a very sort of an aesthetic change. That's kind of, I suppose, this body transformation. But I don't know, is the is the goal with the Amazing 12, though, is not purely aesthetic, is it? It's also performance. Uh, well, yeah, kind of explain to us how you find how you find this with with people you work with. I think like anything, you know, like a, like a bike, there's gears, isn't there? And you, you choose the appropriate gear for your goals and i quite like having the ability to change gears for clients depending on their needs and the a12 plays a role in that you know is, uh, certainly on the performance side and the aesthetic side yeah i think predominantly actually whilst the photos are the the social proof they're often the thing that everyone sees it's not really for me it's not really what the program does the program i think the program is a performance program um and actually, the aesthetic element is really only, it's only really focused in the last couple of weeks. So the diet is not arduous. It, it is for some. And I think I've said this before. You know, attachment is the main source of suffering that people have. They're attached to something else in their life or previous way of doing things. And so as soon as they start doing a health program, nutrition program, they bring with it that resistance and then they start to suffer because every time they turn up, they're working against type. They're working against that, whatever they're attached to, they're attached to some part of their old life. And, and that means that people can have two paths on any of these programs. They can have a path in which they turn up and they get to change their body. And every day they turn up and they're excited and they're, you know, they've got this great opportunity to uh, get healthier, to realize their goals and, uh, and get stronger and perform better and become a, maybe a more, you know, they use on, I mean, Paul uses, Paul McRoy designed the program, uses a phrase, you know, have you ever met the real you? And, you know, that's because he has a belief that the real you should be strong, should be energetic, should be lean, um, should be confident. Um, but there's often things holding us back because we're attached to them. And so I think part of the program is, to address those things head on because we've only got 12 weeks. And I think, I think the thing is about a lot of body transformation programs, they are time, they are time-based. Um, and that sets a fire under the whole process. I'm going to say um, it helps having a finish line, doesn't it? For many it people, does. you know, it yeah, helps yeah. even when you think of like a work project or uh, anything, you know, having a deadline mm -hmm. kind of focuses the mind, doesn't it? And focuses the action and focuses the discipline. Yeah. But with that, there comes costs. Mm. So, you know, uh, you could probably do a radical transformation a similar, a similar kind in six months with a couple of weeks of fast, you know, a couple of weeks of, of, of competition diet at the end and it not be an arduous process and probably still get a similar result, um, particularly if your training was super effective um, and you weren't too, you know, you were gradually losing weight over that time. But because the fire is there and because we've got a timeline, 
it means that you really have to get your mind engaged straight away. And particularly if you have a, a big transformation to make. I mean, Matt was a fit guy already and it was hard work for him. Um, mm. So to get Matt's level of leanness, yeah, and genetics do play a role. You know, it's difficult. I I, I don't wake up in the morning with a six pack. I, I know some people can do it. We've had clients on the program who, you know, by week five have a six pack, you know, and, and we've had other people who don't have a six pack at the end, even though they've lost more, they're stronger, they're, you know, in many ways, the same weight or whatever. So it's, um, but it, you know, that, that, that 12 week period, you've got to, you've got to make a decision to show up and um, commit yourself to a change. It's not just a, it's not just about choice. It's about transformation. You know, it's not about change. You're not just changing. Oh, I'm just moving. I'm, I'm not. I'm not having. I'm having olive oil instead of butter, or I'm. I'm having brown rice instead of white rice. It's not that. That's not what it is. It's a transformation of your mind, your body, of your whole habits and behaviors. Um, and depending on what you come to that program with and what you're dealing with in life, you can either bring resistance or you can bring opportunity. Mm. Do you find that when people <clears throat> get to the end of the twelve? of the 12 weeks is it um do most of them or do some of them or do many of them continue with you or do they kind of get to the end of that 12 weeks um and do they kind of quickly revert back to where they were before or what they were doing before or does it have a real long-term change you know or is it a mixture of all of the above kind of thing uh it yeah. Um, so, you know, I think if someone comes off the street and they say, I want to do the amazing 12, rarely have kept them beyond the 12 week program. You know, that's, that's their goal. That's what they want to do. Um, we now select mainly just from our own client base. So if we do it, we just run it. We're just running it once a day, once a, um, at a certain time slot every week. And I'm only choosing people from our client base who I can trust that are going to bring their A game to it who are in the right place. Um, and that that works for us now because then we've got people who are committed, you know, people we can coach them. They know our training style. Uh, they're comfortable with us. We can actually get down and do some work. Um, uh, whereas, uh, and they and they often, they'll either have frozen their membership and moved to the A12 membership and then they just revert back to their old membership when they finished or, or they, or we have a plan in place and we, and we just set them up and talk to them about doing something afterwards because they are in the mindset that they were going to be coached anyway. And this is just the opportunity to press the button, the big red button go. Okay. Now we can do it. Yeah. I've got a bit of time. I'm not on holiday. Uh, it works a bit easier, you know, et cetera. Um, and yeah, and then they do it. Um, yeah. So it, it can be, and, and do people revert? So what they come out with, they're darn sight stronger than they ever were. So they perform much higher in all the classes. They don't all meet, maintain the same level of leanness because it is, it's really difficult. To, you know, because kind of a peaking, know, there, there are it? techniques it, that we use on photo shooting. There's a yeah, it's, peaking phase to yeah, it. It's yeah. kind of peaking. It's a photo shoot for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a bit like yeah. someone doing London Marathon. Would they do London Marathon the week after and the week after and the week after? You, 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 I mean, your tolerance can go up. Say they did three phases in a row, you know, then they might find it easier to peak each time and have a better result. And it might have less physiological effect and be much better, you know, much better habits in place, so less resistance, better techniques. Um, but they're not going to be able to run a marathon every day. You know, they might be able to run a marathon to get steadily faster, you know, three times a year. Yeah, it's I mean, I remember when I, yeah, sorry, go on, Pete. Now, I was going to say it's that thing we spoke about it with uh, James Brees ages ago of homeostasis, didn't we? Hmm. And it changes your. I mean, I don't know if that happens in twelve weeks, but if you, if you mean, and, and then you might not be as lean a month down the line, but if you maintain the strength training and eating exactly. well and all of that, the, you, your your body becomes more used to being at that state. Rather than they're tougher, they're just tougher. You get someone the who do beat, and then they lose ten stone, whatever, and then just say, "Right there, you go," and then go back and revert to how they were. They go back to straight back to where they were, don't they? Because um, the body, your body, your brain, it does it doesn't like change. It likes to be where it is. 
and it's comfortable where it is. So if you change anything, you've got to you've got to maintain it for a long time before it becomes comfortable in that. Well, that's why you have to transform. You can't change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to have made. And I think that's the ones who are really successful. They come out with a different mindset. They know that they can press that switch when they want. They know that it, they know they haven't got a genetic limitation. They know that they've not that they're not the broken one. Um, and we, it's just a question of priorities in their life at any given point. So you know, if you go from training five days a week, and, and reality is afterwards you have to you've only got time to train twice a week. Then then obviously your result will will diminish a little bit, but you now know that twice a week is a non-negotiable. It's just easy because you've done five days a week. You know how to eat a little bit better. Uh, you know how to, uh, to, to to swing a kettlebell or lift a barbell or whatever with, with better, with greater force, greater confidence. And, um, and then, you know, you can, you can press the accelerator pedal whenever you want. Hmm. I've, I've had that with a couple of online guys, actually. There's one who's been with, he came, he came via, both of them came via the podcast, I think, actually, but um, he he got in touch with me just just over a year ago, but he he could train like he could do five days a week, but he wanted to do he wanted three strength days and then like some conditioning as well. So I was like, that's fine. And so what I do is I cycle the days. So mon- it's like say three days a week: Monday, Wednesday, Friday are the strength days. So say it's like squat, press, squat, and then the week after it would go press, squat, press. And then squat, press, squat, press. Because I could get him to do the whole lot. I mean, he does more than that. AB, right? is it? Yeah, yeah, basically. So I could get him to do the whole the whole lot each session, but he'd just be knackered. So it's like, right. And I, but I said, what will happen here is the progress will be slower. However, it'll, it'll happen. It just means you won't burn out because he's got kids and a job and foreign travel and all this sort of stuff. And he's been on that for over a year. I mean, with variations on it and stuff like that, and different rep ranges and what have you. But he's um, he just he just hasn't stopped making progress, and it's amazing. And then this other guy came to me who's done the amazing twelve actually. He's a Northern Irish guy. He's done the amazing twelve, and then he just wanted to get he just wanted to build his strength. So he came in saying he could do four days a week. So I gave him the, you know, the program. Then he wanted to drop it to three days a week because he does jujitsu and all this sort of stuff as well. So I was like, that's a good, uh, thanks for telling me. You know, this is like the feedback I ask for and what have you, because I get some people who just go, it's too much. I can't handle it. And I'm like, well, let's have a chat then and we'll give you, that's mm-hmm. the whole point. But he then, I said to him, you can do this AB model. Um, and I sent him a program and he was like, no, I just want to do three days of like three lifts. And that's it, because that's what he enjoys. And I was like, God bless you. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> that's even easier to do, right? But I was like, but he's but he's just nails it every time. And he's been like, is is the feedback is like, here's my videos, here's this. So um yeah. But if he's been through the A12, he's probably built the discipline of showing up and doing the work. Exactly. But like you say, it's it's working out how many days a week you can do, what you're going to actually do, and then do it. And it doesn't matter if it's one day a week or five days a week or whatever. It's what you can do, right? Because you get a lot of people who commit to... I mean, the, the age 12, right? People have to commit to it, but it's for 12 weeks, like you say. And then after that, they can change it up, but they have to commit. But at least there's that time frame. But if you get people like us saying, oh, you just do it for the rest of your life. They're like, I can't train five days a week for the rest of my life. It's, you know... No. It's like, <laughs> but I think going from where I used to train six, uh, six sessions and then to four, four is, four is, is probably a good, good fit for me at the moment, you know, um, four times a week. Um, three might be even, yeah, three would be easier to fit in than four, but I don't know if I get the same, you know, I can't cope with more than three. Physically, I can't cope with more than three. Depends what you're doing though, doesn't it? At the moment, yeah. three for me is perfect because I'm actually the weights I'm pressing and and what have you now are way heavier than I ever used to be able to. So it it becomes recovery. So mm. you don't actually actually have to do as much. No, and the you, four, the four more session, anyway. Yeah, the four sessions I do, they're really two sessions, you know, twice. So I've got the essentially the same session, uh, two sessions twice in a week. You know, so mm. one is one is barbell, one is um deadlift squat bench press and pull-ups and one is kettlebell press um bicep curl and a tricep push down you know so one one workout's got four exercises and one workout's got three exercises but the sets you know as you know with pull stuff you know they're some of them a lot of it is sort of 10 sets of each thing so it does take a while and that's hence why i split them up but 
um it kind of yeah i i I wouldn't want to do any more than I'm doing. Put it that way. You know, I could probably yeah. do less, but I certainly wouldn't want to do any more, you know. Um, but with regards to the leanness stuff, I remember when I used to used to train for, for boxing and used to box, I used to have to I used to weigh in at like 64 kilos, 63 and a half kilos, which was 10 stone. It's kind of like welterweight. And I had that as my kind of I'd get to that as like a step on the scales and be that. But I would never, I wouldn't have been able to maintain that for, you know, a few times I'd have to hit it. And then maybe two weeks later, I would have to hit it again. And then a month later, I would have to hit it. So I got very, very good at manipulating my body weight and my food. And when I got to that, I was like super, super, super lean and was probably like a 28 inch waist and not, a, not nothing to grab at all. You know, as lean as anything, lean as I've ever been in my life. And like you say, I just, without having that, need to be that lean i would really struggle to get that lean again without having you know someone putting a gun to my head or having a really really good reason to get there you know um because like pete said i kind of feel like i've been very heavy i've been like 100 kilos and i've been 63 64 kilos and at the moment settling in the kind of 78 to 81 is kind of the middle ground for me and that's kind of where i feel strong i feel comfortable i kind of don't really moderate what i eat or the amount that i eat you know and it's kind of it's something i can sustain i think for the rest of my life you know so um yeah again the james Brees thing a lot of stuff he said was really good dan john was funny though wasn't he when you said the 777 he's like well i'll do 888 <laughs> <Yeah>. one better <laughs> one better yeah eight thousand um, steps eight glasses of water eight hours sleep a night. yeah exactly yeah. do that and then you're better than the seven but anyway when he said the um your height in centimeters minus 100 is give up plus or minus five kilos depending on what you're training for or your sport or whatever is is bang on and i'm i say i'm 172 centimeters i don't know i might be 160 who knows because like i don't know because i don't really measure how high how tall i am Hmm. But I'm like, I'm probably about 172 and I'm usually 72, 73 kilos, bang on. So yeah. that's like, and, and looking at that, I'm like, I'm happy with that. Because yeah. then you don't have to worry about BMI, you don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. Because if I look at BMI, I'm, I'd be happy. If I look at BMI, I'm, I'm borderline overweight, hmm. which is just ridiculous. Hmm. But then again, I just have to probably trim my beard and then I'd... <laughs> The and the other one, isn't it? It's the other one. So you've got the, you've got, yeah, the height in centimeters minus a hundred would be the weight in kilos, which you just said. And then you've also got the, uh, the half your height, you know, in terms of your waist as well, yes. which is the other, which is the other one, which is quite nice because that bypasses the whole BMI as well. You know, um, not the BMI is wrong or bad for like normal untrained you know normal people is is a fairly good indicator you know but um but it's um that that yeah the 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 half of your height being your waist is is quite a good is a good one as well for people you know yeah what were you going to say paul you said something about happy i missed it yeah no i was just about to say uh if i try and get my train of thought um what you want to be is happy at the end of anything you do hmm. you know because not everyone's going to get a six pack. Not everyone's going to have ridiculous. I mean, if you look at some of the transformations, you know, people doing one leg squats with, you know, heavy weights there, you know, deadlifting 200 kilos in, and that's not everyone's trajectory and it won't be. And, and, and actually at the end of the program, you might not even have traditionally impressive weights that you're using. You'll be downside stronger. You'll be much, much more confident in your body but you won't necessarily be breaking records just because you've done a 12 week program, hmm. but you've got to be happy, I think. And you'll only be happy if you've, if, if you've started working on those fundamental elements that help you kind of change your perspective on what's possible, I think. And that's, and that's what, you know, Pete said, uh, you know, I'm happy at this, you know, I'm happy at this. I mean, that's and the thing. Why, is why do anything different? If you're happy, if you're genuinely happy, hmm. you know, not just saying it because of positivity, you know, police or anything, you know, you could just say that you're, you're happy, then that's fine. You do it, you know. Well, I'm, ha I'm happy with this, but I'm, I'm going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? That the, 
the weight someone uses or whatever the, the speed they run out or they cycle out or the distance, you know, whatever it is, it's all just down to individual progress, isn't it? In development. So, um, well, that brings us to what we were talking about before, um, before we pressed record, wasn't it? Cause I said about the, the post that Paul put up saying basically everything else being equal. If, if you get stronger, you get more confident. And so it, it it's a it's a big subject, isn't it? But it's like why do why do most people want to join a gym or whatever? Do they to, to lose weight, to build a bit of strength, even though they probably don't realise that they just think it's more of an aesthetic thing of losing weight, not getting ripped or anything like that, just losing a few pounds. But actually, if you do strength training as well, you know you maintain lean muscle or lose body fat. That's what people actually want, isn't it? Um, even though they don't know it. So he, the, the post he put up was about, you know, because then people can, like, we've, we've just talked about being happy, being confident. And his post was saying, show me someone who's stronger than they were this time last year or who has just got stronger and tell me that their confidence hasn't got better in their abilities and resili resilience, their abilities to be able to do stuff. So like this walking group that I'm doing, there's a lady at the minute who's asking a lot of questions and she's she not confident that she'll be able to turn up and do it. And I'm like, turn up and we'll we'll see how it goes. And then we can build from that. And that's building confidence because we've spoke a lot about it in the past as well. And I think Matt was talking about something similar to this last week of just being able to say to someone, do you want to come and walk up this mountain with me? And they just go, yes, please, without even thinking about it. So this lady would be great to be able to say, right, we're going on a walk. And she's like, yeah, I'll be there. And that's it. And whether she, whether if she can do it, that's the confidence. So... Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to hear what you guys think about about that because it was also how much strength do you actually need so when you get stronger you get to a certain level you become very strong do you need to get stronger from there and paul's argument was like well there's no diminishing return on that because you, you just build more it'll take longer it'll be minimal and all that however he doesn't see any downside to that but in my head, most people don't even need to worry about that end of it. They don't need to care because they just need to get stronger than they are now because most people are, are relatively weak compared to what we used to be as well. And that's not being horrible to anybody who's out there and all that. It's just most people are. And I think most people know that, but they don't know what to do about it or they don't really feel the need to do anything. So what do you I guys think? I think there's also, I've just, I've just come into the end of the, uh, the Dan John uh, Easy Strength Omni book and and one of the things he talks, because he obviously trained for track and field and for throwing, for discus and 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 different events. And he kind of there's numbers that he that he talks about in, in quite a few of his books where he says, if you are a discus thrower, these are the standards you want to get to, you know, in terms of you want to clean this much, you want to, you know, um jerk this much, you want to be able to squat this much and deadlift this much or whatever. And he says, getting over those numbers. There's no more benefit. Do you know what I mean? It's like once you once you're this strong, you're strong enough. Do you know what I mean? And if you're not throwing the discus further, or if you're not doing the high jump better, or whatever the event is, then strength isn't the issue. You know, it's like the technique that you're using. You maybe need to spend more time on something else. You know, and it's the same, I suppose, with like uh, where he. One of the things he says is once you can do ten pull ups that's strong enough you know what i mean and if you've got a specific goal where you want to do 20 then that's fine but if you you know i think it, there is this kind of thing where we can always be chasing more and more and more and more in the same way that people like like matt said with the aesthetics and the and the um the obsession with ever increasing leanness where it can be it can potentially become quite destructive where you know oh i think I, i've seen it in my time you know 25 years sort of in the industry where I've seen a handful of people um uh, yeah probably between sort of like half a dozen and, and 10 something like that who've tipped over into like you know body dysmorphia and anorexia and stuff like that because they get yeah, course, they start yeah. losing weight and they start getting lots of positive reinforcement and I know this it, there has to be something in the mind going on as well it's not just but 
you know, they get a lot, a ton of positive reinforcement about, wow, you're looking fantastic. How much weight have you lost now? And they tip over at some point and then they become quite ill, you know, um, and and it's clear that this person is now, you know, they've not just lost weight and they've got trim and lean. They're, they're like anorexic now. They've got a serious problem going on, you know. Um, and I think the same thing with with strength. You get people with, um, you know, bigorexia and constantly chasing more muscle or more strength. And that can be quite destructive as well. So um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, there is a point, I think. There's a tipping point where something goes from a, a healthy pursuit to a unhealthy obsession. Yeah, well, the, if you're gonna if you're gonna take it to a logical conclusion and be facetious, you'd say the world's strongest man should be the most confident person on the planet. But obviously that that that, that would that doesn't really make sense, does it? I mean I, I think I think someone who's stronger um is harder to kill. <laughs> you know, it's it's um you know, there's a resilience in you when you're when you have strength. So there's the practical application of strength, but I think after a point, um, like you say, I do agree that there is there that there needs to be. You know, there's a limit to its application, and after that, you need to develop other qualities. You know, there's a quote from what's his name, um, Jordan Peterson, where he talks about how men should be lethal. You know, and they should be able to create high levels of aggression or violence, but you choose not to. So the ability to apply power is almost more important than than to have it. But without it, you're you're then fearful, and then you're dangerous because you are mm. then scared. And so you know, th these are things to think about. I think a lot of people that I see, what do they what do they say? Weak men, well, the, is that classic thing where weak men make dangerous times, dangerous times make strong men, strong men make good times, good times make weak men again. You know, it's, it's, there needs to be, I think there needs to be a certain level of ability and the application of strength in everyone because you're going to be more resilient, more confident in your abilities, more confident in yourself and your opinions. Strength is one aspect of that. I think you need to practice the uh, critical thinking. I think you need to practice uh, strength training. I think you need to have, you need to be able to go for days, being able to walk and run. You know, anyone who tells you just strength training is the only way to do it like Peter goes out on these long runs, you know, if you haven't got capacity, just do things, then you're pretty useless. But you also need to have those extra gears and choose when to use them. And I think that that is, that comes with the critical thinking. But if you don't have the extra gears, you don't have a choice. Hmm. You, you're just stuck on that. And, and then you have to do, make do with whatever it is. And then, then you have to start relying on other people. I have to rely on this. I have to rely on that. And if they're not doing it, then I'm, then I'm a victim, you know? And I think there is something to be said about someone who goes out and, and creates strength, creates the body that they want, creates the lifestyle style that they have. They don't need to rely on as many people. They just choose to contribute in different ways. And then they can become a, what's it like uh, Schwarzenegger says, you know, be useful. I think it's just more useful, you know. I say it's being physically capable, isn't it? It's being physically capable of, and it doesn't, we, we're using the term strength, but it's, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really your ability to to look after yourself and, and be useful to others and to be a help for others and 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 all the rest of it. And that's why it'll be fantastic. It'll be really fascinating when we get um Louise Louise Greer on. I think you know, uh, yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Strong woman, you know, like just people who have these uh, and get, well, Gary when we spoke to him, you know, people who have these what could be perceived from the outside as as disabilities and challenges and uh you know but but choose to um adapt you know adapt and and like we said gary's at the adaptive strength games out in america this weekend you know it's uh it's, well, it's not like stephen hawking he, he had no way in any way of creating what we would traditionally see as strength but at some point he created some something some inner strength some ability to to be useful to, to create opportunity um you know and i think yeah he I, I had a purpose didn't he but yeah very strong purpose he had, yeah. a, he had a strong purpose um because he should have died How old was he? He, died well, he was 21 when he got it and then i think he should yeah, have died, so he should have died in, his, in his in his 20s shouldn't he yeah. so he lived like 50 years longer than he <laughs> than he was expected to hmm. um yeah 
That's no, it's, and I think it's interesting just to sort, of, to sort of loop back around and tie it up because we spoke to uh, to Matt last week and he was talking about being in this state of... Um, and, and it ties in really well. We, we mentioned as well Pat Flynn talking about being a, a robust generalist, you know, and then... so And, 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 and Matt used a different terminology for it, but being um, physically capable in... In, in many areas. And then when you decide to kind of turn your focus onto something very, you know, laser like focus in one area, you've got the ability to suddenly switch and say, right, for the next two months or three months, I'm going to do this. And then you can become exceptionally good at that one thing because you have this kind of robust generalist um, kind of physical fitness and physical capability going on, you know, um, well, a lot of people that... want to be loved, don't they? A lot of people want love. And we all say, we throw the word around, I love you and this. We throw it around sometimes almost without meaning. But I think actually a lot of people want to be respected. They want to respect. They want to say, I respect you. You know, you're a person of your word. You're someone who's able to deliver on something. You're someone who's, got, who's capable. And I think one of the strength is one aspect that provides respect, you know, not, not, in, a, not in a physical violence way, but just in, just in a way that someone who, who, who you respect, you can do something. You can, it has mm. value, you know, mm. and it's an expression of that because it's hard for you have to earn it. You're not mm. just given it, you know. I think strength is earned. You know, I know Paul Mackerel. We've been talking a lot about his program. He talks about strength is granted, but it's also earned, mm. Mm. Um, mm. and it takes a lot of work to earn it. Mm. There's I'll something. About, yeah, go on, Paul. I was Pete, to a guy the other the other day. This is just spark spark a memory. I was talking to somebody in in. Uh, the mindset group that I do the other day and he was saying at work he used to, he doesn't anymore because like he, he has to do stuff for people right? and he'd be the guy who knows how to do everything and not everyone does if you know what I mean because he's been there for, for years and he's just the guy who knows things right so he, he, he ends up like helping people do a lot of things and he doesn't always get thanked for it and he realised he was doing it for people to say thank you and then when they didn't he would get pissed off so now he just does it because it helps people and that's it and if they don't say because i was like but if you're helping people all the time and they say thank you all the time it, it's like you say the I, people trip around i love you and all that and then it doesn't really mean anything they say thank you but they don't necessarily they're just saying it because it's something that they should probably do rather than like a you know, a thank you or like at the end of the year, just like a thank you for everything that you've done, a sort of thing. You know what I mean? So it kind of, it's one of those things, if you're doing it to get praise from other people or to get likes from other people on Instagram or whatever, how's that going to, how's that going to end up? Or if you're just doing it because it's the right thing to do for you and for everybody else in, in the world, if you, you know, if you're a better, better person for it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, there's. A, I'm listening to a podcast at the moment, a Dr. Chatterjee one. With uh, we, I kind of will touch on it, but then I don't really want to go too far into it because it will open a whole new, whole new pathway, you know. But um, he's interviewing. I think she's an Australian lady who's the author of. Is it like the five biggest regrets of the dying or something? It's it's a book anyway. And she worked in palliative care for ten years and worked with you know so spent time with hundreds of people as they as they physically died, you know. So she would, in some cases, be their last conversation, you know, and the last person they spoke to. And it's and um, yeah, it's fat. I mean, I, I, I listened to the podcast. I think she'd be she'd be an amazing person to speak to because how it changed her life from having these conversations with people as they as they died. And and one of the things you just made me think about there, Pete, was um, was, you know, uh, which, again, ties into a lot of what we spoke about. I suppose they can tie into a lot is, you know, the ego and why we do things and if we do things for the the um the love the adulation the the respect of other people you know rather than what is true to to ourself you know and one of the biggest regret i think the number one biggest regret was uh that she talks about is is i wish i'd had the courage to to live my life the way i wanted to rather than do things because other people expected it of me do you know what i mean that kind of that 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 was a huge thing so um what is courage i mean that's the thing isn't it because we can't wait for it to happen it's like you can't wait for inspiration 
Mm. You know, if you, every time you only wrote songs when you're inspired, or you only read a book when you're inspired, or you only went to work when you're inspired, you'd be unemployed quite quickly. Mm. The same with courage, you know, it's it's a practice, isn't it? Well, this is what she talked about a lot. And again, we could, this could go on now, but she she talked about choice. She's talking a lot about choice, you know, and how we all have choice and we all have choices every day and uh, how we make those choices. And we mentioned, I think it might have been before we, we, we came on, I was talking about this new book, this North Star thinking, you know, which again is is that kind of, that guiding principles, you know, becoming, like you said, a person of principle, a person who does what they say they're going to do, but a person who does it from a very um, uh, internal kind of place, you know, uh, rather than, rather than trying to impress others, you know, it's, uh, it's fascinating, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, and it gets down to the whole, you know, like Matt, when we, when we got to the end of the conversation with Matt and he said, I thought I wanted to do this thing and get to, again, to loop it back around to where we started almost. I thought I wanted to do this thing. I wanted to look a certain way because everybody on Instagram wants, you know, seems to look that way. Everyone gets respect when they look that way. You know, you, you get, you get heaped with praise. Everyone's, you know, liking what you do and sending you great messages, but I did it and I got there and I realized, you know, I'm pretty miserable and, I, and I'm not happy. And this isn't me, you know, this doesn't resonate with me and my values, but I've done it. And there was lessons learned from doing it. The number one lesson was, you know, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> and I won't, and I won't, and I won't do it again, again. But, um, but, but at least there was a lesson. What's that? What's it goes back to Dennis Vazillo. He says, uh, you know, he's got one, what's his lesson. He said, don't quit. And the second part was if you, if you have that attitude, you'll think twice about what you start. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think Matt went through with it because he knew, he said he knew a few weeks before the end, it wasn't for him and he wasn't enjoying it, but he'd come this far in the process that he wanted to see it through, you know, and he wanted to get to the end, um, which again is, a, is, a, is, a, is an admirable, is an admirable quality. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't finish things because they're too, it's too uncomfortable. Yeah. It's just the yeah. price of entry to some things, isn't it? Yeah. There was, was an interesting thing that, so I used to be, coached years ago by Paul Moore. I don't know if you know if he's or not, but yeah. he, he used to say a thing, because he would put like out old videos and stuff like that. He's quite brash and all of that sort of stuff. He's not everyone's cup of tea, right? So um, he used to like he used to get people saying, you need to get over yourself. Now, I'm not an expert on ego and all that. Just you mentioned the ego earlier, James, right? I'm, I'm not an expert on ego and all that, obviously. But... He, like people would say, you need to get over yourself, mate, because you're like full of yourself and all that. He goes, no, no, no. The problem is I have got over myself. That's why I can do all these videos like I am, because it's like, I don't care what you think, because hmm. I'm doing it for me, <laughs> not for me. He's doing it to help people, but he's doing it to help himself as well. And then if people get helped because of that, brilliant. And that's getting over your ego, isn't it? Because your ego is there to protect you. So hmm. there's kind of a, there can be a, um, a misunderstanding of what it actually is within that. And people think people with a big ego are all full of themselves. And it's like, no, no, people with a small ego are full of themselves because they've, they've crushed it. Hmm. And that's actually, and it's not believing their own bullshit. It's believing in themselves, isn't it? Hmm. You know, but also susceptible to other people's beliefs. Yeah. So, cause influence, like it, it's all about influence as well, isn't it? Because if you're doing like, so Matt was doing something it was for him, but he was doing it for not necessarily the right reasons, but it wasn't to impress everyone on Instagram. But if people are doing that, it's it, that, that's the influence of, of the whole of seeing what everyone else is doing, isn't it? Rather than just doing it for you. Mm. And for people, some people that might be right for them. And that might, and that's what he said, wasn't it? For some people that might be right for them. And it might be, it might resonate with their values and it might feel perfectly aligned to them. But for him, it wasn't aligned to who he was, um, which, which ultimately, you know, is, is a, is a lesson learned from it. And he, and uh, in the grander scheme of things, it probably took, you know, 12 to 16 weeks out of his life to find that out and, you know, kind of no long harm, no long-term harm done, but he's learned something quite valuable. And now, like, like we said, he can, he can talk to people from a place of experience around that as well which is uh which is good now cool excellent i think we'll start to wrap up there guys that was uh yeah it was interesting yeah having having this discussion um around a number of a number of topics um 
so yeah next week uh dan and phil and then more uh more guests to follow so uh i think we've any probably no wrapping up is there today pete and paul we've kind of been talking ourselves for the last hour you don't want to you don't want a haiku <laughs> the entire works of shakespeare in there uh, yeah that's it yeah the entire works yeah three lines <laughs> <laughs> Get off that chat GPT or whatever it's called. AI. What was that? One, day, one, one, to one week we'll turn up and it'll just be like, what was that thing? What was the thing in like the 80s? Um, The uh, the kind of computer generated, not Harvey Wallbanger. What was the thing? You know what I mean? Oh, Max Headroom. Max Headroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll just be like a computer generated pool, like uh, AI pool joining us. Yeah, well, do, you, do you remember... I mean, we're not far off that scene in, in De Demolition Man where they're all sat around the table with their heads floating on a, yeah. on a screen. The, the thing is, though, with Paul's Wi-Fi, the way it is, he looks like Max Hedrick. <laughs> 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 no, the thing is, it's not the Wi-Fi that's the problem. It's just my my life essence drifting and oh, inter cool. being interrupted. Yeah, that's generally where it is. Glitching me. There you go. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you joining us uh, each week. And uh, we will be back next week. Please do like, share, subscribe, leave a review if you're watching or listening on a platform that allows you to do so. If you'd like to join the Facebook group, go into Facebook under groups and search Help Oddity and we will let you in. Um, we will be back next week uh, with uh, Dan, John and Phil Maffetone for that world first. That will be fantastic. Uh, this has been episode 161. That will be episode 162, unless we squeeze another one in between now and then, which I don't think we will. Uh, so we will see we'll do, you. We'll do a part two for this. <laughs> <Just> the <outro>. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you next week. Take care and bye-bye.